Hey there, casters, I'm Pruitt. This is Jim Davis. Maybe you found a book in some attic somewhere, or you just feel it's a component of your person, and you just need to know how to get it out. We'll sit a spell and let WebDM continue its RP series with Wizards. You like wizards, right? I do like wizards, in you've been, fact. You've been known to play a wizard in your day? They're my favorite class in any RPG, period, full stop. Like, yeah. I like anytime I play a video game RPG, I, I have to stop myself during character creation and go, you know, why am I making a fighter? Why am I making a rogue or whatever? I'm going to go about halfway through this game and be bored and play a wizard again. And that's how I am a lot of times with Dungeons & Dragons. Yeah. Is I make a character, I'm like, oh man, I'm super excited to play this this fighter or this monk or this this whatever, this druid, and I, I get about somewhere between the first to through third sessions will be like, I should have just played a wizard. Yeah. I, so I, I like them because when I started playing Dungeons and Dragons, they were the only character class that had powers. But their powers were tied up in these spells and these spells came associated with this sort of like esoteric weird resource management spells per day sort of system okay so i know this spell but you fire it off once and forget it so i was fascinated by by that and and i just it stuck with me throughout uh throughout dungeons and dragons and so wizards have a, a very um, special place, and, you know. Sorry, sorcerers and, and warlocks. I just am less impressed by you. Yeah, um, you don't scared. you don't study enough. Yeah, <laughs> well, and I am also a person who believes that that expertise trumps natural talent. I just do, right? Yeah. And and I also don't see them as a sharp dichotomy, right? I, yeah. I see natural talent goes hand in hand with expertise because I don't know anyone that has natural talent doesn't practice like a you know like a madman. Yeah, uh, and and well, and so, at least at least those that want to actually exercise and use their natural talent. They some, want to some develop. Some people their, just they, let it right, they fall just, by the way. They let it fall by the wayside. They're content for, with, without any training. But the people who want to develop their natural talent do practice. And so I, I don't see like particularly when it comes to like sorcerers and wizards, the debate there of like well, sorcerers a better arcanist because their 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 magic is natural. And all I hear is their magic. They didn't have to work for their magic. Right. They didn't have to struggle and and suffer and sacrifice for yeah. their magic. Yeah, they they were, were just they woke up one day and had it. They were born with a silver wand in their mouth. Exactly. Yeah. And so I see wizards as the plucky sort of underdog, the the scrappy. I found this book and through hard work and study and 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 sacrifice, I wield you know the the powers that can alter reality. And that's where I start when it comes to like role playing a wizard. You have this intense intellect, this mind that can that can conjure magic and understand and pierce reality, and you got it that way through dedication and hard work and study. That's where it's at for me. Okay, well, so let's 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 really start start the big conversation there because that is that is the hallmark, like you said, of a wizard. Your intelligence. Yeah. Sometimes you know you're going to get up to like a twenty intelligence. So right. how do you role play that? When obviously most people don't have a they're not ge they're not hyper geniuses right yeah. yeah you don't have a bunch of Stephen Hawking's playing D and D <laughs> right and even the even <laughs> and even like the intelligence of someone like a like a Stephen Hawking or other sort of famous public intellectuals is very specialized you can use public intellectual figures and things like that as models for your NPCs or your player characters or whoever it is that you're trying to to portray with the high intelligence because you can see for them that there are areas that they are brilliant in mm -hmm. and areas where they're not so brilliant in you don't get that level of mastery and expertise without sacrificing other things usually that's your your sort of time spent studying other stuff so yeah in matters arcane your wizard is supreme that they have a level of mastery over their magic that a say a sorcerer who just they know their magic intuitively they cast it maybe they practice a ton and cast with it and, and are, are just you know they're as good if not better in some areas but they don't have as much of an understanding of it and your warlock is over here taking their power from a patron maybe they take the time to study how that magic influences them or or how they master it. I'm a big fan of an intelligence warlock, actually. Um, but the wizard is over there. They have to, in order to do this, they have to spend time with magic, studying it. How does it work? What are the patterns of it? And that needs to be reflected in, say, their approach to problem solving. 
perhaps your high intelligence wizard when it comes to problem solving they approach it in a very rational step by step okay what's our goal here how should we approach this what should be the first step that we take mm -hmm. they're constantly collecting data and information they want things verified with proof and with with uh, you know with examples and they're using logic to sort of think through yeah. things that's one way to sort of uh, approach uh, high intelligence at every decision point Always remember Occam's razor. Don't make any leaps. Right. <laughs> Try to make the decision on what the information you have, and you know, you'll probably actually come up with the right answer. Much like portraying um, a, a character with a high charisma, if you're not necessarily a charismatic person or, or someone who's socially adept, it's another thing where you can always approach your dungeon master and say, hey, I, my character has an 18 intelligence. That's like way above where I'm at, right? Yeah. And not only that, but their knowledge is specialized in a fictional, make-believe uh, field of expertise. Approaching your DM and saying like, how much leeway do I have to just make things up yeah. and say that what I make up is the truth? Yeah. You know, how much leeway do I have to metagame? Part of the reason why I like playing wizards is because I happen to just know a lot of crap about the D&D multiverse and monsters and other stuff. And having a, a high arcana and, and other intelligence-based skills allows me, I, in my mind, to, to, to flex a little bit of that knowledge myself. That little bit of that player knowledge. Yeah. To have it transferred to the character knowledge so that it's like, oh yeah, my guy studied that. And why wouldn't they know? I'd right. temper it myself and I wouldn't do it if a dungeon master was like hey please don't do that kind of metagaming but it's an option but it can be difficult right like mm -hmm. you you know you watch a show like say the new Sherlock Holmes or something and you want to portray a character like that right someone that observes things and sees the hidden patterns and connections that other people miss uh, someone who's able to act on those decisions quickly and be two or three steps ahead of their yeah. of their opponent surprising people with what they know and where they're at and you know maybe you have a bit of flexibility with your dungeon master that says like hey my my guy's pretty intelligent I work a full-time day job and I'm not a wizard and you know I got stuff going on back home and yeah. <laughs> is it okay if I like occasionally say like oh yeah my character would have done that because they're a hyper intelligence I took keen mind I'm, you know. Well, that's like the complete stopgap for anybody who's worried about that kind of shit. It's like, well, I do have keen mind, so if I saw it, I do remember. Yeah, keen mind is, another, is a good feat, but even if you're not playing with feats or it's going to be a long time before you take keen mind or you're just like, yeah, it's the only feat for wizards and I'm tired of taking it. Um, then take observant. <laughs> take observant. Linguist is not a bad one as well if you need an int bump. and Just ways to, to effectively portray that, that intelligence. Perhaps a degree of aloofness is another way of portraying that. You're just sort of like cold and reserved but at the same time like part of the appeal of playing a wizard is that you are approaching the game in a thoughtful manner yeah. and you're thinking ahead and 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 fifth edition is more forgiving of this than prior editions with how spell selection works and how you cast your spells but part of it is going like yeah I, I don't know what we're gonna face today I'm gonna have to prepare my spells in anticipation of an of the unknown mm -hmm. and so gathering information using uh, the tools at your disposal to know as much ahead of time is um, is part of role-playing a wizard is, is part of like yeah, I, I need to know what we're about to face um, so that's a highly intelligent thing to do, if that makes sense. Oh, yeah. well, no, it completely does. I mean, you, once you prepare, if, if you properly prepare, then, you know, you should be ready for anything. Right, and this is why spells like, you know, div various divination magics and the like, you know, that help the player gather more information from the world so that they have a decision to make. Maybe you enlist the aid of your fellow players, and, mm -hmm. and you know, when it comes time to make that decision, it's your wizard who did it, but you've... You're consulting with your your fellow players, like, oh, what should what spells should I select? What how do you think we should approach this problem? That's the playing of the game part of it yeah. that then gets translated into the role play aspect. Let's move into into Xanathar's uh, RP hooks here. Yes, because uh, you know they're they're interesting for a wizard. First, you have your spell book, then you got ambition, you got eccentricity. Yeah. So spell book for a wizard. It is, I mean, it's everything to a wizard. Without your spell book, what are you? Without your spell book, you're nothing. Uh, or at the very least, you are your the spells that you had prepared in your mind at that, that moment until you get your spell book back. Right. Your spell book, and to a lesser extent, your arcane foci and your spell components, they are as important to a wizard as the fighter's weapons and armor. They are as iconic to a wizard and as significant to a wizard and can help you tell the story of your character. Yeah. 
in a way that deserves some some thought and and thinking it out. And so, like, what form your spellbook takes? Is it the traditional codex with you know the hardback? cover and the pages and you know a little lock on it um, that's one way the very traditional I carry around this big book and, and read it when I need to there's the whole gamut of forms that your spell book can take yeah it doesn't have to be a book with pages in it I right mean, humans have used various medium throughout the centuries yes walk around with clay tablets of course right. you want to make sure you have a higher strength <laughs> sure you want to make sure you have a bit of a bit beefier yeah if you're just like got a whole <laughs> stack or like you know like they're like written on like round uh, little clay tablets and you have uh -huh. like a spool of them sure yeah, yeah they're all uh, attached on a string or something yeah. uh you've got like stone tablets like that, Moses coming down. Right, and you just <laughs> to, to deal with that. A lot of these unusual spell books do present some practical problems, but thinking through those things and, and yeah. how they uh, impact your character is fun. Maybe you've got like links of knotted cord. Uh, you know, like how the Inca used to take, uh, you know, measurements and, and record data. And it's like you just study these braids of cord and within the, the weft and weave of the braid is where your magic is. And it's the meditation on that. Perhaps you, your spellbook is like a giant mandala or something that you roll out on a reed carpet and you, you just stare into this pattern on the ground and out of that... Mm -hmm. Your magic emerges that you then prepare in your uh, in, in in your mind. There's a whole bunch of stuff. metal discs or in, uh, in an ancient scroll yeah. that you that you're constantly unrolling and that you're not sure has an end. You it know. just keeps on. Rolling. It just keeps on going. Yeah. Um, you go memento with it. And you yeah. get tattoos. So every morning in meditation, you like strip down, right. bathe yourself, bathe and then yourself, begin you have studying. a mirror that you, yeah. you know, you have to have a bag elaborate mirror that you're using to find all your, you yeah. know, whatever. Yeah. Another way I uh, mentioned before, uh, Wizard, I played Antonia Stark, mm -hmm. my, my ironclad Iron Maiden evoker. Yeah. Because I had jewel cutting tools. You let me etch onto small mm. jewels all of my spells right. that were like in my helmet and basically like using kind of magnets, I could like put them in front of my mm. eyepiece. Exactly. So it was like a HUD. Yes. Um, and you were okay with this because it's like I, I had to make a roll to do this, uh -huh. just like you do. And you were okay with that. Yes. Hey, this is all aesthetics here, right? This, I mean, is, this is all just, aesthetics. This is just yeah. how your character interacts with the world with their spell book. And as long as it makes some sense. Yes. This is still a fantasy game, it's so it's okay to go game. nuts a little bit. It's still a fantasy game. Like, have game prayer beads with, like, uh, like those, those uh, I forgot, I can't remember the civilization, but um, they, they, they etch or paint on these tiny beads mm -hmm. the story of their people. And so, like, they're these beads, beads, like, you know, like 20 links long. It's the history. So you just, like, very tiny writing, but all right. your spells are on these beads. Maybe your spell book is your familiar. Right, and part of it is that you're familiar, uh, it, when, when you go to prepare spells, your familiar is there with you, instructing you and helping you work through the magic or something. Or maybe you have something like a, a, a memer or the skull of a long dead wizard that's enchanted with its spirit. Like and Bob. Like Bob from Dresden. And when you go to study your spell book, it's really you communing with the spirit of this dead wizard that's in this skull who's teaching you the magic. Mm -hmm. Maybe, you know, part of what your job is to collect new spells that this, this wizard spirit doesn't already know and input them into the wizard. And you will then pass that skull onto your apprentice so that they, you're a long, long, unbroken line of apprentices who have studied under this one great master and you're just passing the skull around. So like the spell book is one of those things that if you have something that's unique and different, it can really define your magic and can really offer you something beyond just the, I'm a studious wizard who with their nose in a book all the time and ink stained fingers, mm -hmm. which is fun in and of itself, but you have all this other conceptual space to play with. This doesn't even touch on non-humanoid spell books, right? Like these are spell books that are meant to be manipulated and used by medium-sized humanoids. What do you, maybe your wizard has a spell book of a monstrous humanoid or a monster that yeah, they came like across. A, like a storm giant's spell book. Massive. They live inside un, it. Unwieldy. <laughs> <laughs> they just, all the spells are written on the walls. Uh, <laughs> do you have a, another creature spell book? Do you have another wizard spell book? Was it stolen? How did you acquire your spell book? Is your spell book uh, a labor of love that you created because you need to, uh, you know, it's, it's what's required of all freshman level wizards, you know? Yeah. You just have to. Before you gain that first robe, you got to make your spell book. And so your spell book has a, a personal significance to you. Or maybe you're like Huel Thunderbuck and you stole your spell book. 
and you and you don't know where the wizard is who you stole that spell book from because they shouldn't have left it unattended. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know you were just holding it for him. You're just holding it for him. I just found it. Uh, <laughs> and Fucking half -inch. You do something like that, and now you've got a, a rival who's tracking you down because you you swiped their uh, their spells. Thinking about how you came across it, what what form it takes, the practical yeah. uses of the spell book in play. Uh, those are all how you build up moments in your in through the course of play that that add color and distinction to your uh, to your wizard. There's yeah, some of many ways you can do that. Yeah, and as you build those moments, obviously you're building towards something. Yes. So we bring we go to our second hook, which is what is your ambition? What are what are you striving for as a wizard? Right. Yeah. This is the question. that's like, why did you study magic in the first place? Yeah. And and what is it that drove you there? Is the study of magic a, a you know a tradition for your people? You know, is it something that you maybe one of your parents, uh, you know, pursued the study of magic and and you're just sort of following in their footsteps? Maybe you're an orphan who's men, you know, who's a wizard took you in and it's just sort of what you do. The current wizard I'm playing right now, he he studies magic because he's tired of being a country halfling with, with no money and no power. He was clever enough to know that magic is the one of the few ways that a normal person, a simple folk, can mm -hmm. can become great and 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 get the sort of wealth and power that and respect that uh, he will desires. And right. so for him, magic is a means to an end. Magic yeah. is a tool to be used for personal enrich enrichment and, and satisfaction, whereas others have that like magic for its own sake is, is what drives them. Right, as bards past have said, first you get the money, then you get the power, <laughs> then you get the respect. Sure, yeah. And yeah. so, you know, what level that respect gets to. I mean, like, is it, is it, like, is it personal? Yeah. Are you trying to be like the head of a guild? Uh -huh. Do you want to conquer the universe? You yeah. know, or is it just, you know, you just don't want to be a poor, <laughs> No, he just, he, you know. He wants to live in an extra dimensional tower with unseen servants that bring him everything he wants and summoned creatures there to entertain him and speak yeah. to him. And he's tired of being a dirt farming country bumpkin. And why, you know, that's a pretty good motivation for a lot of people. Yeah. Uh, good enough motivation for Huel Thunderbuck. <laughs> why are you a wizard? Well, my parents made me come to wizard school. Yeah. I don't really want to. I, yeah. just, I just wanted to be a rat catcher. You just want to be a rat catcher, but there are some of them who, who claw their way into magic. That's a very personal motivation, but you can have a cosmic motivation. Maybe you are a wizard because there are threats and dangers out there that you happen to know about, that you that it's like, okay, I, I have to study magic in order to mm -hmm. protect the place I love, or, or in order to join this cosmic war that determines the fate of the multiverse. Like, yeah. th that's another, you know, sort of another avenue for, uh, for yeah, your ambition. Where you live is on the borderlands of a portal that where the blood war constantly just spills constantly out of. Constantly rages, yeah. And you're just like, well, we gotta have all the wizards we can We gotta have all the wizards we can get. We don't know what's gonna spill out of that portal and, yeah. and come after us and make life difficult for us. Yeah. Living on the sidelines of a cosmic conflict sounds like a real drag. It's kinda like why I wouldn't want to be on Earth in the Marvel Universe, because it's like, yeah. they just always come and fight there. Or if you're just forced to be in the front row of a Gallagher show, that's a little dated. But, it's a little dated, but yeah. They're, they're, uh, just Google it. Yeah, no, um, really, very few people You want to cast shield as much as possible. Yeah. You know, you have your ambition. You have your ambition. And but Wizards, uh, obviously, they developed quirks, right. eccentricity. What are some fun ones, uh, you know? You know, if you've ever known an academic, <laughs> if you've ever known someone who spent most of their life in school, and the, the, the sacrifice, and as I'm someone who was on that path for a while, and, and, you know, you, you have to make sacrifices. It's mm -hmm. one of those things where when you have, when you're in a class and it's like you gotta read these four books by the end of the week and, and write a paper over each of them, that pressure does something to people. Yeah. Whether it's hard drinking after your studies are done, <laughs> yeah. or, <laughs> or uh, you know, uh, an extreme, you know, like isolation, or or being, uh, you know, re you know, introspective and, and just spending a lot of time by yourself, and that leading to you forgetting how to behave around others. There are always these sort of weird eccentric eccentricities and quirks and things like that that come from people who like intensely study one thing. Yeah, they can be fun little mannerisms that you throw in. Maybe your wizard like is one of those people that just bounces their leg constantly. I don't. I've never understood why people are bothered by that personally. I know that they are, but I just never understood. Well, anxiety that. brings anxiety. Someone sure. sees someone being anxious, and you start being sure. Anxious. If I have to sit still, it makes me anxious. Um, yeah. And yeah. so, <laughs> and so like it's the universe. Right? Right. That works. The universe is always in motion. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> 
I don't know if you remember the Wu Jin from past editions, right? Like the, the current Wu Jin is sort of tucked in under yeah, the Yeah, like the Elemental or uh, Oriental Adventures. From the Oriental Wujin. Adventures. Yeah, yeah, they're yeah. sort of like the, the wizard of that setting. And there was always these taboos yeah, yeah. that they had to abide by. Never cut your hair, don't eat meat, don't bathe, never speak to someone of the opposite sex. Like all of these things that would that could if the dungeon master uses them, become a problem for your character. And the dungeon master should be bringing them up in play because they make for more interesting games when you use mm -hmm. flaws and taboos that the characters have. Um, but their magic was tied to that. If they violated one of those taboos... Oh, it's like a paladin's tenant. Yeah, yeah. right. Like, and perhaps your world is like that. Perhaps magic is just so weird and, and eccentric itself that the practitioners of magic have to abide by all these weird things. So it's like, yeah, this tradition of wizards, they do not cut their hair. They are known for their long flowing beards, their long hair. Mm -hmm. their, maybe it's extreme. Maybe it's like they don't cut their fingernails. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they don't, yeah, and it's just like they, they keep themselves intact. Yeah. Because their magic flows through them and to clip off a fingernail it's or some hair magic is to cast your yeah, magic yeah. out. Yeah. Well, sure. <laughs> and maybe you take that to some extremes where it's like nothing leaves their body. In which case you have to get creative and sort of think through the implications of that. But it might be one of those things when they need something to leave their body. They need to visit a little boy's or girl's room. Uh, then they have to perform some sort of atonement ritual afterwards to appease the spirits of magic and bring them back into their good graces. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta cast the take a shit ritual. <laughs> Just so they don't piss off their 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 the source of their magic, right? Or they're germaphobes and they like they never sh like you can never shake or or touch someone else. Yeah, yeah. Like and that that would be that would start to be a very interesting uh, ordeal, especially if you have to do a touch spell. A touch for the touch spell or something. Well, you make your familiar do it. <laughs> right, right. But what happens when your familiar, when your familiar dies? Familiar dies. Or you really there. need to do a thing. Yeah. How as a DM would you handle that? Like I, it'd be you, one of those things where it's like the, the taboo is the taboo and casting the touch spell would go off but then after that you, you'd have to atone or, or, or come back in the good graces of the spirits of magic. There's a ton of stuff like that. Any custom or taboo or, or stricture or something is fodder for that. You mm -hmm. know, whether it's uh, a physical one that's like, okay, you know, maybe your wizard, you know, has weird issues with where they sleep and they yeah. have to always sleep on the soil of their homeland. And so they carry a, a bag of big sand. ass bag of dirt around with them. <laughs> or maybe it's like a vow of celibacy or a vow of poverty uh -huh. or, or something like that. A vow of silence except when they're casting spells or yeah. something like that that gives them uh, the source of their power. Maybe yeah. it's mental. Yeah. Right, and maybe your character has something that to an outside observer would look like, say, OCD or something like that, where it's really I, like I take I, the component with my right hand <laughs> yes. and I put it in my left hand. Because, <laughs> because well, and, and let's think about this yeah. for a minute. The OCD is one of those things where your brain starts telling you that you're com you're compelled to do things that you think have significance because they will alter an outcome. Yeah, and it's just sort of becomes obsessive because you're like, I need this outcome, and so I've got to do this thing, and mm -hmm. it's a problem for people because it can get in the way of enjoyment of their life. But right. for a wizard, those might be rules you need to follow. Yeah. I mean, and an outside observer might be like, yeah, that wizard's a little crazy. They, they walk in three circles before they sit down anywhere like a cat. Yeah. You know, <laughs> or they open and close every door seven times before they can go through it. Mm -hmm. And to an outside observer, it might be crazy and eccentric or something, yeah. but to the wizard, you know, those are the kinds of things you need to do to make your body ready to cast spells. Yeah. You weren't born with the gift. You didn't compact with a higher entity. You do this yourself, and that requires some sacrifice. I'm a fire mage, so anytime I light a mundane fire, I have to light it, put it out, and light it again. Yes. To yeah. show them that I am not beseeching you for power. Or I just, I just, need, I just need some light. <laughs> and so, like, are you trying to steal it? No. Are you trying to steal it? No. Yeah, no. no. And that's, it, but so it looks like, well, he lights candles, blows them out, and then lights them again. Yeah. You know. But that, yeah. that could be a way. Before he takes a drink of water, he always pours half of it out on the ground. Yeah. That kind of thing. Maybe it is mental. Maybe it's a mantra that you have to chant to yourself or, or a type of slogan or phrase. Or maybe it's uh, you know, a particular way of doing things throughout the day. Little rituals mm -hmm. and little uh, compulsions and things are ways of portraying to other people like my character is different. And my character has made sacrifices to get the power that they have. Mm -hmm. And those are the sorts of things. They also incidentally work well for like weird things your patron wants you to do if you are thinking of like warlock 
sidewalk stuff. It's like your patron can ask you to do weird things too. Yeah. But this is more like self-imposed taboos and the like. They they have their ambition. They they follow all the little quirks and taboos. Yep. And so they have their magic and their spells. So when you're role playing, like yeah, there's a fireball. You put some guano and some sulfur together and a little mode of fire, and it's a fi- ball of fire. Right. But does it have? I mean, does it have to look like that? What do your spells have to look like? Right? Like. Yeah, I mean, and, and even like beyond like the the manifestation of an individual spell, just like what's your character's relationship to the magic that they wield? Yeah. Now it, that's the job of the dungeon master to either give the player like, hey, here is what the structure of magic looks like in my world. Here's where arcane magic originates. Here is what you're manipulating when you do that. This is one of those things where I love uh, Vance. Right? We we call this style of casting uh, Vancean casting and yeah. that's from Jack Vance who was a, a sci-fi and fantasy author that influenced Gygax along with a host of others and he wrote Tales of the Dying Earth which is about maybe Earth set you know hundreds of thousands of years from now as the sun has you know, has uh, you know gone into its red giant phase or whatever they call it I'm not an astrophysicist well, um, it's not completely gone red giant because that's the whole thing is going to swallow earth it's going to swallow but earth it is dying it is dying it's a red sun though, it's a right? red bays sun the, it, the, the, and, yeah. the world in red light and these wizards that are on this very cynical very pessimistic world that's in its dying days well, how they cast spells is they uh, they are train their mind to capture these thought demons in their mind prison yeah. is about the best way I can explain it. A spell is a living thing that exists on another dimension, and a, and and the wizard, when they want to cast that spell, they are. Uh, summoning it into existence, trapping it in their brain, which is why they can only hold like three or four of these at a time, Mm -hmm. and then releasing it into the world. And the act of... Casting it out? (laughs) Casting it out. And Mm -hmm. the act of preparing a spell is you spend hours casting it, and it's only the trigger that releases it that you do in the moment that the spell is invoked. So the casting of a spell takes hours, and, and that's why in older editions of Dungeons & Dragons, it took you 15 minutes per spell level per spell to prepare all your spells for the day. If you were a high level caster and you had spent all of your spells the day before, you might literally be spending the next two or three days studying your magic again. Yeah. Wrestling those spell demons into your mind where you're going to capture them and hold them prisoner until you release them and in, uh, uh, unleash them on reality. Uh, truly powerful wizards in Vance are able to capture demons who can do a whole manner of effects. And, and they don't do just one thing, it's just like, hey, I need you to do this thing. If I remember correctly, in Tales of the Dying Earth, like a powerful wizard could capture up to like four. Uh, four. Four, maybe five. Maybe, I mean, Something yeah. like that. But most wizards are like, I can keep one or two. Yeah, but and, and the level of spell effects in those are, are on, on par with like six level and above spells. So they're not casting little pissant, yeah, you know, yeah, no. shields and protection from evils. They're summoning prismatic sprays and teleporting all over the place. And yeah, yeah. The omnipotent sphere <laughs> that they have. So uh, it, it's one of those things. It's it's a series of books if you're interested in uh, in in the origins of where D&D magic uh, comes from and the inspiration for it. Mm-hmm. It's really worth reading. And at one point, they're time traveling all over the world because a bunch of... They're time traveling, and then they travel to the edge of the universe. Well, they're looking for unstones. They're looking for unstones. Like a bunch of wizards get on a traveling castle and travel through dimensions because they're like, oh shit, we found out about these unstones. We've got to get there before they're right. gone. Right. And it's just like, oh, this is where D&D came from. This is where D&D but, came from. But with, so. the, with the naming of the spells and just like the magic items they have, it's quite obvious when you read it, like, oh yeah, yeah, Gygax was reading this shit. They're reading it, and, yeah. and the, oh, the ostentatious names and everything. So that's, I recommend that for anyone who's like a fan of wizards and arcane casting and Dungeons and & Dragons in, yeah. in general. Those are good books to check out. But thinking about returning to a, the, your game world and, and, and uh, you know, the wizard players that are in it, it's worthwhile for a dungeon master to think, what is arcane casting? Yeah. Are we going like with a forgotten realm setup where there's a weave of magic and there's a god or goddess of magic who oversees that weave that 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 force that penetrates everything and surrounds us and binds us etc cetera, etc cetera. and the spells are just patterns that are imposed on that weave 
that produce a certain effect. And, yeah. and the, learn, the learning of magic is just learning those patterns and how to manipulate them. That's why a fireball cast by a wizard, sorcerer, and a warlock is the same fireball. They're all learning how to create that pattern. They just have different ways of, of learning how to do that. Mm -hmm. Maybe you've got something like that. Maybe it's more of a arcane casting is the leftovers of the fundamental forces that created the world in the first place. Yeah. And, and arcane casting is about tapping into this mystical creative force that that exists for anyone it permeates the world but it's less powerful than it used to be or perhaps it's growing in power and, and early magic use was f bumbling and 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 took a lot of time and everything and now yeah. we've refined it down to a bit of a science where we like we know the pattern that produces fireball no more experimentation is needed yeah. this is the formula in that regard it's more like it's kind of like science like we figure out these certain things and how to manipulate the forces of nature a more contemporary example would be like Doctor Strange yeah like how like how you see them doing somatic components and it's more like martial arts really right uh, right right but I, I do love that that iteration of magic casting well it, it is a good example of somatic spells yeah. right or somatic components for spells because you know it, sometimes it's presented as sort of like finger waggling and it looks more like say sign language or something mm -hmm. but I always think of d d casting it's a whole body experience yeah you know you're somatic that's why when you're tied up you can't do it because yeah. if as long as your hands are free you should in theory be able to waggle them and do a little thing <laughs> yeah. but if it requires you to stand in a certain way to have your arms out or your you know where your body is in relation to the space around it influences the magic that flows through it and in your descriptions of spell casting this is why we're spending a lot of time talking about all this because your descriptions of spell casting and your descriptions of how you use your magic are, are a great way to impart uh, your role-playing characteristics that you want to impart through your character so like the sort of magic that you practice says a lot about your character. If you've got that kind of like, I'm gonna move my body in a certain way and produce this effect, that's different from the, you know, the wizard who's got all this, the spell components and they've mm -hmm. got their symbolic bells and, mm -hmm. and you know, all this other accoutrements of, of magic that they have. An example of differ differentiating yourself uh, is not a wizard, but in my game I have a monk uh -huh. who's, a ha who's a half drow and he wanted fairy fire. Yes. <laughs> and it, the way he wanted to do that is he, you know, he has his cigarettes with his with his medicinal herbs. Sure. And so we switched it over to fairy fog where he blows it takes out. a deep <laughs> deep hot box and just blows it out in an area and that that causes people to cough and whatever and the smoke clings to them and it makes it easier to hit yeah. and it's just like Hey man. Yeah. Well done. Well done. And, and and that's one way of looking at spells in general. Are spells yeah. just effects? Yeah. Are they just an effect that's produced and the player gets to sort of determine how that effect manifests manifests itself? And most of them are like that. D&D mm -hmm. &D is one of these weird quirky systems where it's a mix and mash of a lot of things. If you play a system like GURPS or, 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 or Hero System, uh, they are effects based. You know, it's like, okay, I want to produce a fire m magically or psionically or whatever and you buy that effect and then how it looks and how it manifests is entirely up to you. Right. D&D &D has this weird mix. Sometimes it's an effect that's manifested and, and you can uh, you can get a little creative with it. Other times they bake in the the specific form of the spell right. in in the spell description and you just want to make sure you're you run by the DM like oh hey I'm I'm changing things up or is it all right for me to change this yeah just because they might assume it works the way it does in the player's handbook right but I think that goes back to your point that what you're seeing is the end result of all those years of study with magic yeah right like this is what we've gotten to and we know for sure works yeah. You yeah. know for sure works. And so, but that doesn't mean that your player can't experiment. Change one little component of their somatic components and yeah. oh, now you can do an ice ball instead of a fireball. Exactly. Right, there's, I mean, to me, I, if a player came to me and said, I want to make an ice wizard, I'm like, okay, well, just all the spells that have whatever, you can just change it to ice. Because yeah. who gives a shit? Yeah. It's yes. the same kind of, da I mean, you're still doing the same amount of damage. Right. In, to, in my mind, you are limiting how much you can affect. What happens when you go up against something that is immune to ice? Right. I mean, obviously you took Elemental Adept, so you can cut sure. that down to resistance, but anyway, sure. you see what I mean? I mean, it's it's one of those things where I, I think a lot of people fret over how many enemies are immune or resistant to certain types of magic and, and whether or not a, a, a damage type is more common than another should factor into the balance somehow. I, I don't think so, and I don't think Wizards of the Coast is doing that either. 
fire. I, I think that if you wanted to have a psionic, a psychic damage fireball, that it's not going to break your game. And besides, that's a really cool spell. Like, yeah, yeah. My, my fireball lights your mind on fire. Mm -hmm. It's not a physical burning fire. It is, yeah. a, it is a spiritual fire that will, that will burn away your ego. Yeah, and that's pretty fucking cool. <laughs> yeah, and it, and, and and it would be the bane of barbarians. <laughs> it sure everywhere. would, wouldn't it? <laughs> the barbarian in your group would be like, whoa, 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 what the hell, man? Uh, where are we? Where are you going next? Oh, I was gonna move on to to how you cause that magic to come into yeah, yeah. being with arcane focus and your spell components. Yeah. Like, what what does that look like? Does it have to be a crystal at the end of a staff? Do you have to <laughs> adhere specifically to what's in the book? I, you know, I don't think that you do, and I think that it's one of those things where your arcane focus, whatever form you choose to have it take, and the spell components that you use, whether you use a component pouch or you're just using the, the expensive material components that are in the spell, all of those things say something about your wizard. I like spell components because I like the idea that these magical effects that, that we're trying to make manifest require these silly, arbitrary, weird things like a Buff ball of fluff or some bat guano, and I know that there there's a uh, there's a story behind nearly every material component in in the player's handbook. Right? Yeah, two coppers for detect thoughts. <laughs> sure, penny, penny for your thoughts. <laughs> right, yeah, penny no, for your thoughts, or or yeah. you know a, a bit of fluff for sleep or, or an illusion spell. Yeah, they're all clever in jokes and puns and things like that. And that, I I love that. Trust me. Right, <laughs> and they used to be more more prevalent. I think a lot of those have maybe fallen by the wayside. But I like them because the the presence of spell components to me makes magic more magical yeah. than just a crystal that shoots a laser beam. Yeah. Like, I will be perfectly honest. I find the whole, like, I, I have an orb or a crystal or a wand and it shoots out a beam of colored whatever. It's, it's a very modern interpretation on magic. I associate it a lot with Warcraft. That's probably because I played a lot of Warcraft when it was first out. But you also see it in, like, Harry Potter. Yeah, it's very, very Harry Potter. And sort of, like, magic is arcing off the thing and it's bleeding and falling on the ground like sparks and... That's one way of looking at it. I like a magic that's more invisible, yeah. that's more subtle, that's more like I feel it around me as a pressure in the air right. than I do a special effect that the CGI department cooked up. Right. And, and so for me, spell components suggest a certain mysticism. These are symbolic, sympathetic magic. Why am I bringing sulfur and bat guano together? These things don't do anything. In, mm -hmm. in the game world, right? Uh, but symbolically, they have a, 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 a mysticism to them mm -hmm. that when coupled with my understanding of how magic works, produces a ball of fire sufficient enough to flash fry people. You will kill someone with this thing and kill a lot of people with it. It's powerful magic. Mm -hmm. And so these item, these mundane items that you need um, then take on a mystical quality. And second off, if you're not tracking spell components, it's a pain in the ass. Just to be honest, it is. Yeah. It's sometimes worthwhile. I completely agree because like you were saying, uh, magic is everywhere and when you combine the motion and the words and these disparate things, like, yeah. like you said, just a leaf and a ball of fluff, but it's it's the fact that when they all meet at that one moment, yeah. that is where magic finds its portal into the real world. Right. And that The act of it is magical yeah and so tracking components uh, you know while it's a pain in the ass but uh, you know if you got to track your arrows as an archer you gotta you gotta you gotta take care of other things and it just gives your character more character and you got to go track down components hey guys i gotta go to the mountains anybody want to come with me right well that's the other thing is that when you're not focused on these styles of game that are save the world go 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 like yeah. we can't rest we can't what are you talking about we can't we don't have time for this right now we've got to save the world but you just have adventures you right. just have people who are out to gain more power and wealth for themselves they get involved in a short little adventure it's over in a couple of sessions then they're moved on to something else then it's one of those things where you ha might have a wizard player or another arcane caster that goes, yeah, I am running low on guano. Like, I, <laughs> I am we running... We gotta get this shit in order. Uh, these, are, you know, I've gotta go find a cave and harvest some, and that's an adventure. That's a thing to do in an adventure. That's a possibility of an encounter that they didn't plan for. It's a possibility there are other people there gathering the same spell component, and maybe there's a rival, or a foil, or an adversary, or someone that just doesn't like your character. Maybe they decide to go by themselves, and someone's like, oh, finally the wizard's by themselves. Let's capture this guy. Let's capture this woman, because they're really powerful, and we could 
use them for ourselves. Those are moments in your game that's the opportunity to interject something and to do something. I think it should be player directed, right? The player yes. should be the one that says, I want to track spell components because I think it's going to be interesting for me. And then the dungeon master then has the opportunity to use the fact that they're asking for these components uh, as, as fodder for the occasional adventure. We can do the same for Arcane Focus, right? Like, where did they get this thing? How did you come by it? Is it something that you created yourself? Is your wand something that you carved yourself from a tree struck by lightning that survived? Yeah, and you want to be Roy Hobbs. Right, something like a shin bone of a manticore that you helped participate in, in taking down that you're then going to craft into a bone wand that will do whatever. Maybe you have different wands for different types of magic or you know, depending on the, the material components that they've got, or have to use an orb with your divination spells, but when you're using your transmutation spells, you use a, you know, a, a different kind of uh, focus or something. Mm -hmm. I, I like a book as a focus, right? I know we've talked about this before with uh, Jonathan Strange and, and or, um, whatever it is, Dr. Norell and Mr. Strange, whatever the show's called. The wizard has a library of books, and this book right here is a spell book with one spell in it. Yeah. And when he needs to cast that spell, you have to read from that book, to cast the spell, but that book is the focus. Yeah. Or perhaps the focus alters the spell in some way. You're looking to cast a frosty fireball. Maybe you do it through hours of practice and creating a brand new spell. Or maybe it's just like, yeah, I found some milky quartz that I'm going to affix to my wand or staff. And as long as I've got that with me, I'm going to be able to blast out a, a, you know, an icy fireball. You have your spells and what they look like and your focus and the components and you're altering that. But casting all this magic. Yeah. It has to alter you in some way, right? I mean, this is more of a Warhammer concept. Uh, it, yeah, it's one I, of my favorite concepts from Warhammer. But I, yes. I do enjoy it, like the fact of what kind of spells you cast change you somehow. Yeah. Like yeah. how how would you how do you see that? Can't let ha the sorcerers have all the fun with their being changed by their magic. If you see magic as a living force in your world, that magic isn't just a thing, a a, a, a inert thing that happens that you know produces effects but magic is a is alive has a will of its own and the wizard and other arcane casters just barely control it enough to kind of do what they want it to do yeah uh, then you might have a case where the style of your magic uh, how you approach it or, or something that's emblematic of the school that you're a part of then um, makes a physical change in you perhaps if it's divination your eyes go cloudy and milky and you have, say, uh, some sort of reduced vision in order to help you see clearer in your mind. And maybe like your... The blind diviner? Something like that. Or like your improved divine portent when you get like three rolls is where it changes. So you can like tie these physical changes into when you get those upgraded special abilities in your class. You can say, mm -hmm. okay, well, I'm 14th level. I've got that extra ability now. Or I'm 10th level and I've got that new one. Like maybe this is the time that my necromancer starts taking on a very sallow corpse-like appearance. Dark or eye, dark rings under the eyes. Yeah, dark mm -hmm. rings under the eyes, just an unhealthy, like, greasy hair kind of thing, or like elongated fingernails or something. Uh, their skin starts to retreat back from them. Uh, mm -hmm. Or maybe their enchanter takes on a sort of pleasing and, and intoxicating aroma that just follows them wherever, or whatever sort of mag enchantment magic they use that's more like fear-based or something. Maybe it's a pheromone or something that just sort of puts people on edge. It's not enough to alter a game effect, but it might change the way an NPC reacts to them. It might change the way they interact with the world. Uh, so consider having a manifestation of your magic uh, impact your, the physical appearance, the mannerisms, something about your caster. It's a good way, again, of showing other players in the world, like, what are the sacrifices have you made for your magic? What uh, impact has your magic had on you? Part of the reason why we spent so much about like magic and spells and how it looks is like that's the wizard's deal. Yeah. They don't have anything else. They have some special powers, maybe something that alters their magic, but for the wizard, you're there for the spells and you're there for the magic. Really, you should spend a lot of time thinking about how it works, what it looks like, mm -hmm. and what it can reveal about your character's personality right. through the use of their magic spells. Yeah, because uh, the more life you give to your spells, the more life you give to your character, and right. you make it make them seem more like a r actual, real, you know, living, breathing thing. And it's how you make magic magical. Right. There's a lot of people who look at magic in Dungeons and Dragons, and they they find it not magical enough. 
and they want it to be more mystical, more based in superstition and things. And you can do that very easily and very evocatively just through your descriptions, thinking through how your magic works, things like that yeah. will, will go a long way toward yeah, it. Yeah, and, and describe uh, more what, what happens unless I cast Fireball. Yes. Describe going through the motions and a moat coming out and a burst of flame. Right. And stop saying, I cast Fireball. And we didn't even talk about Wizard's Towers or anything oh, like yeah, that. Oh yeah, we didn't talk about any you of know, that. Any colleges, that shit. Going, to, going ritual, to Wizard ritual Academy. Magic. This is why I want a whole series just on magic. I want us to do a whole series where we go through both RP and break down some of the iconic spells. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. What are we doing? What's the next show? Moral quandaries. Conundrums. Mor moral. Do you have a conundrum? <laughs>